right. Welcome, everybody. It's 8.01. It's time to start. And so I'd like to welcome you to Grand Rounds. Uh, we always appreciate you taking the time to come and hear what I think are some actually fantastic and stimulating uh, talks. My meteorological fact is that we're going to have freezing rain, snow rain, um, all in like one uh, week, which is a crazy thing in the state of Wisconsin. So for Grand Rounds today, I'm very excited to have uh, Dr. Sarah Panzer, who is an assistant professor on our tenure track in the Division of Nephrology presenting Grand Rounds. And her Grand Rounds are entitled, Chronic Rejection After Kidney Transplantation, Transplantation Is There Hope? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Panzer. First of all, I asked her, you know, what does she love the most about her job? And she said that the research work she does, the work in her lab, um, and working with the grad students, the medical students, in that kind of um, research environment is the thing that brings her the most joy. So she did medical school here at University of Wisconsin, and that was followed by her internal medicine residency and internship at University of Vermont. She then, she then went across the country to Colorado and did her nephrology fellowship in the Division of Renal Diseases and Hypertension at University of Colorado, and she followed that with uh, being the nephrology chief fellow at the same institution. She spent one year at Colorado being an instructor and then joined us uh, on faculty here in 2014. She is an assistant professor on the tenure track. She also is the associate director for the UW Health Glomerular Disease Program. And one of the great things I think as far as some of her awards and reviewing many awards for her is last year, and two, two years ago now in 2017, um, in transplantation, uh, she was one of the top 10 basic abstracts of Kidney Week in 2017 for the American Society of Nephrology. She has 14 refereed articles since she has been on faculty here, as well as 14 abstracts, and we are very uh, happy to have you and glad you are on faculty, so come on up. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so let me ask you a question. If you were to require a kidney transplant, how long would you expect that kidney transplant to function? Is it something that you would expect to last for a lifetime? For 20 years? For 10 years? Or five years? So think about that for a second and see if you can commit to an answer in your mind. And in just a second, I'm going to flip the slide and we're going to talk through some of the numbers. Okay. So what I'm showing you here is national data looking at outcomes of graft survival. And we have three time points that are being looked at. One year, five year, and then 10 year graft survival. And on the graph, we're showing trends over time. So this is for the last 20 years looking at graph survival. On the table, I'm showing you the absolute numbers. So what you can see from this data is that if you had received a kidney transplant in 1999, the probability that that kidney transplant survived after one year was 86.8%. The probability that that kidney transplant had survived after five years was 66.4%. And the probability that that kidney transplant was surviving after 10 years of time was 43.7%. If we look at the next time point where we have 10-year follow-up data, that's in 2006, and we see that there's a slight improvement in terms of the percentage points, but overall the trend is the same. And then looking at the year 2011 and 2016, we see similar patterns over time. So getting to that question that I had posed to you, if you were to ask what is the time point at which the expected half-life of a graft would be, the time point being when 50% of grafts have failed and 50% of grafts are still functioning, that half-life of an expected deceased donor kidney transplant is around 10 years. So for a lot of patients and for a lot of providers, that is surprising information. And certainly it's a big challenge in the field, and we, it's definitely an area of active interest of research and clinical work to improve in that area. So definitive answer for this question, if you had received a deceased donor kidney transplant, the half-life of, of that graft was expected to be around 10 years. 
So the goals for the talk today, at the end of the talk, there are a few items that I would like you to be able to take away from this. I'd like you to be able to identify the preferred renal replacement therapy for patients who have end-stage renal disease. I'd like you to be able to compare and contrast the outcomes with dialysis patients versus patients who have received a kidney transplant, and to be able to identify the major cause of graft failure. In order to do that, we're going to cover a few things. So on the agenda for the talk today, we're going to talk about national outcomes among patients with end-stage renal disease, looking at patients who are on dialysis and patients who have received a kidney transplant. We'll discuss the major cause of graft failure in the United States, and we'll also discuss the current understanding, mechanisms, and therapeutics that we have to prevent graft failure. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about the transplant research program at UW Health. So first up, let's talk a little bit more about outcomes. And I will certainly get into all the stats and figures, but I always think it's helpful to place this in the context of a patient. So as an example, I want to draw your attention to the woman on the right. This happens to be Bonnie. She is a kidney transplant recipient through UW Health. And this is her background. So in the 1980s, she was diagnosed with lupus. And then at age 33, she developed end-stage renal disease. She was fortunate that she was able to receive a kidney transplant, which was donated by her sister. So for a patient like this who has arrived at this destination of end-stage renal disease, they really have a decision point then. The branch point being either initiation of dialysis or receiving a kidney transplant. And that decision at that junction has real implications for these patients in terms of their health. So one area where people are very interested in is mortality and how this compares in terms of outcomes for these patients. So this was a major study that was done in the field. And what they were interested in looking at was mortality. And the two patient groups that they looked at were patients who were on dialysis and waitlisted for kidney transplant. They were able to divide these up into two groups, looking at patients who remained on the wait list and those patients who went on and they received a kidney transplant. And on the y-axis, what we have is the relative risk of death. On the x-axis, they had matched these patient groups for follow-up time. And there are a few interesting things to note. So one thing is that looking at the reference group, those patients who remained on dialysis, by comparison, the transplant group actually had a slightly higher risk of, of mortality following kidney transplant. And that persisted up until three months. And then at three months, that marks our break-even point. So that's where we see that risk was equal. Then looking a little bit further on, at around six months, we start to see a survival advantage. And this survival advantage persisted throughout the duration of the study, such that overall, what they saw was transplant recipients had an associated 68% reduction in long-term mortality risk. So we're seeing a definite improvement in terms of patient mortality with transplant. In follow-up with that study, what they were able to do was to take some of their mortality data and do calculations to sort out what they would expect would be their projected survival benefit for their, their transplant recipients. And when they did that and looked across their entire cohort, what they saw was the expected survival advantage was around 10 years. They then stratified this by age group and found that the patient group that had the largest benefit was in age groups age 20 to 39. But of note, across all age groups, all these patients had a survival advantage with kidney transplantation. So some people may wonder, well, you're certainly gaining years of life. Are these quality years of life? So people have looked into this as well. And studies assessing quality of life for these patients have found that with, transplantations, patients ha with transplantation, patients have improvements in terms of their scores for mental health, social functioning, physical functioning, as well as general health status. And it's not just patient-reported health status. We have objective measures as well of improvements in health status for these patients. So this was a study that, again, looked at the patient group of patients who remained on the wait list versus patients who went on to receive a kidney transplant. And they're interested in two outcomes here, one outcome being overall mortality, the other outcome being cardiovascular disease. And the main reason for this is that we know across the board, for all patients who have kidney disease, the main driver of mortality is cardiovascular disease. So on the graph, there's one thing to point out. Although they graph these things looking fairly similar, of note, the scales are dramatically different between the two groups. So the waitlisted group, the scale on the y-axis, this is death rate, goes up to 100 per 1,000 patient years. And the transplant group, this is the max on the scale, goes up to 40. So you can see just across looking at these two groups by objective numbers, 
the mortality was significantly higher in the waitlisted group versus the transplant group. The other thing to notice is the pattern, because very distinct patterns emerge between these two groups. So looking at the group of bars in the back, this is looking at overall survival, overall mortality for these patients. And what you see with the pattern for patients who are waitlisted is that this progressively increases over time. With the transplant group, we see a very different pattern emerge. So in the first three months, we see that there is an increase in terms of mortality, but then there's a reduction. And the overall numbers nowhere near approach those patients that were waitlisted. So the data here is similar to that prior study where we saw increased risk of mortality in the first three months following transplant, but following that, overall the mortality rate was lower. The other thing to note is in terms of cardiovascular disease, what do we see with progression? So for the waitlisted group of patients, so that's the front bars in the graph, we see that as time progresses on, cardiovascular disease deaths continue to increase for this patient population. And the thing that is striking is that there's a very different pattern that we see for patients who are transplanted. So for those patients who are transplanted, we see increased risk of cardiovascular death in the first three months following transplant, but then that risk is reduced, and we see that really we don't see the same progression at all that we would see with the waitlisted group. So main conclusions from the study, what we observed was that kidney transplantation halts the progression of cardiovascular disease in patients with end-stage renal disease. So a lot of people are very focused on risk factors for cardiovascular disease in this patient population. And this study was interested in looking at pre-transplant compared to post-transplant factors. And so not surprisingly, pre-transplant comorbidities, kind of the traditional risk factors that we think of for development of cardiovascular disease, were associated with increased risk of post-transplant myocardial infarction. So things like diabetes, coronary artery disease, personal history of myocardial infarction. But somewhat surprisingly, looking at post-transplant complications. So they looked at a few things, including new onset diabetes following transplant, which was associated with a 60% risk increase of myocardial infarction. But graft failure was a really strong uh, risk factor for development of post-transplant myocardial infarction with a 2.78-fold higher risk. So what we see here is that kidney function is really closely linked to cardiovascular disease in these patients, and that the cardiovascular disease benefits that we see really exist while there is a functioning kidney. And so graft failure has a really big health impact for these patients. So I've talked a bit about some of the medical sides of transplant versus dialysis. There is also a cost with uh, this disease and treatment. We know end-stage renal disease is a rather costly disease, and it accounts for 7.2% of the overall Medicare budget. In 2016, Medicare spending on treatment of patients with end-stage renal disease totaled at $35.4 billion. On the graph, what I'm showing down, what I'm showing is the breakdown of cost by modality. So this is the Medicare cost per patient per year. And so for a patient on hemodialysis, the annual cost for that therapy was over $90,000. For peritoneal dialysis, the annual cost was $76,000. And then for patients who had received a kidney transplant, cost was between $34,000 to $35,000. So we can also see a cost differential in terms of overall expenses uh, for these patients. So I think going through all that data, one thing, you know, assessing all of that information, probably on this point you're on board with transplantation. Transplantation is probably the best option for these patients. So if we start heading down that pathway, there are also a few obstacles that we encounter there. And the first thing that we encounter off the bat is that supply does not equal demand. So the current number of people on the kidney transplant waiting list in the United States as of yesterday when I last checked was 94,781. The number of kidney transplants that were performed in 2018 was 21,167. So you can see we have a big gap in terms of supply versus demand. And we have a long way to go to be able to bridge this to get um, kidney transplants to all the patients who need it. And sometimes it can be kind of difficult to wrap your head around these numbers. And so just for reference, I happen to uh, look up what the full capacity of Camp Randall is. So a few of you may have been at this uh, center on campus. Camp Randall at full capacity is 80,321. So if we were to take all the patients in line waiting for a kidney transplant as of yesterday, they would fill up Camp Randall and we'd have an additional 14,000 people waiting in line for a kidney transplant. 
So the scope of the problem is big, and the problem seems to be growing in size. So shown graphically here are the number of people on the kidney transplant wait list, trends over the last 20 years, as well as the wait time. And overall, we see an upward trend. And really, the projected numbers don't show any trends that this is going to be decreasing anytime soon, as well as wait list times are increasing. So if we were to look back about 15 years or so, wait list time may have been around two years, two to three years. Current numbers are closer to four years. And this really actually depends on the center where you are in the United States. Some centers have wait list times that are on the order of five to seven years. So like I had talked about, there was a little bit of um, difference in terms of geography. And we actually are fortunate that we happen to be in a region where we have a really good transplant rate. And part of this has to do with the activity of the transplant center as well as population density. And it's not that we're not seeing increases in our numbers. So these are numbers of the UW transplant program in terms of numbers of people on our wait list. So if you look back in the early 2000s, that wait list number was around 500. Recent numbers, we're seeing that the number of patients on the wait list are ranging between 1,000 to 1,300. So we've seen more than a doubling of the wait list at our institution. So certainly we're seeing the same effects that we have uh, nationally. So to summarize this first section just about some of the clinical outcomes for these patients, transplantation is the preferred treatment for end-stage renal disease. And we've seen that transplantation is associated with improved mortality, cardiovascular outcomes, quality of life, as well as cost for these patients. And we also see that the life-saving benefits of a kidney transplant last only as long as the transplant is functioning. So what does this mean for the average patient? Getting back to our patient example, so we have this patient who had received a kidney transplant at age 33. If we go forward in time, what happened? Well, 20 years later, that first kidney transplant failed. So this patient is now at age 53, and now we're back at the situation where this patient has arrived at end-stage renal disease. So again, we face two options. Do we initiate dialysis, or could we potentially get another transplant for this patient? She went on to receive a second kidney transplant, and this was done through a donor chain where her daughter was able to donate into the kidney donor chain, and she's pictured with her daughter here. So some people may wonder, are we going to go through round two of a transplant? Is there any actual benefit to going through retransplantation for these patients? And this study looked at addressing that question. So they looked at patients who had a primary kidney transplant done, failure of that first transplant, and then went on to either receive dialysis or receive retransplantation. And what we see is that those patients who got retransplanted had a lower mortality rate, as well as when we look at their adjusted risk for death, we found a 50% reduction in mortality associated with retransplantation. So again, getting a transplant, even a retransplant, has a benefit in terms of patient survival. And you may wonder, how often do we encounter this? And this is something that probably a large number of our patients will encounter. This is data looking at the patient distribution over uh, 2017 to 2018 in terms of age of transplant recipients. And the two biggest groups that we see are in the age ranges 35 to 49 and 50 to 64. So knowing what you now know about graph half-life, it's very possible that the number of patients in those age groups will require retransplantation for failure of their primary kidney transplant. And in fact, this is something that we see with some frequency at our institution. So this is looking at indications for transplant over the last five years or so, and how many of those transplants that we do are done for the indication of failure of their primary kidney allograft. And what we see is around 20% of all transplants performed at UW Health are done for the indication of retransplantation. Overall, the vast majority of people are still on their first kidney transplant. So this is looking at prevalent patients. Around 85% of patients are still on their first kidney transplant, but around 15% of our patients are retransplanted. And by retransplanted, that includes patients who are on their second, third, or even fourth kidney transplant. So summarizing this section, um, graft failure requires retransplantation or return to dialysis. Retransplantation is associated with a survival benefit. And I put this figure in here of kind of the cyclical nature that we're seeing of chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. 
And I think a lot of times we approach chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease as a very linear process. And we think of patients going through CKD stage 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and arriving at the destination of end-stage renal disease. But I think a another aspect to think and include in that perspective is that for a lot of these patients, they cycle through different stages of end-stage renal disease. And so they may go through times where they are on dialysis as a bridge to transplant. They receive their first transplant, failure of their first transplant, and they may go on to be re-transplanted. And since we are a large transplant center, it's very possible that you will encounter these patients in clinic and in the hospital. And they may be at various points along this cycle within end-stage renal disease. And also, having looked at the data that we have, we know that these patients are high risk for cardiovascular disease. So again, another likely factor that plays in that a lot of these patients will be patients that you'll see in clinic and in the hospital. So next up, let's discuss the major causes of graft failure in the United States. So just refreshing on that figure, looking at first graft outcomes. One thing that's very striking is when we look at graft survival for the first year, overall, it's very good. And in recent years, we're seeing graft survival rates that are 90 to 95%. We see a step down at five years and another step down at 10 years, such that at 10 years, we're looking at about 50% graft survival. And this has been a big area of interest for the field. And people have wondered, why do we see this big step down with later on in terms of graft, failure, graft survival? And a lot of people are wondering, well, what is happening during year one that seems to be impacting later years with graft survival? And one thing that historically was obvious to a lot of clinicians was that we were seeing a lot of acute rejection. So in the 1990s, about 50% of our patients were having acute rejection episodes during the first year. And a lot of people pointed at that and said, okay, this must be some area that we could intervene on if we were able to improve acute rejection rates. We're hoping that this would translate into benefits in terms of long-term graft survival. So there was a lot of focus and a lot of effort in terms of how can we address the problem of acute rejection. And there was success in that area. So modern um, immunosuppressive regimens and improvements in, in treatment and um, uh, other measures have improved acute rejection rates from 50% that we used to see down to recent rates, which are 10% or less at a lot of centers. However, a lot of people have been frustrated that with this big improvement in acute rejection, we haven't seen the same magnitude of change in terms of long-term graft survival. And a lot of that work and focus that was done at improving one-year and short-term graft outcomes was done at our institution here. So the UW has a long history of kidney transplant. The first kidney transplant was done in 1966, so we're now at over 50 years uh, experience with kidney transplant. In the 1980s, there was a lot of work done to develop the UW solution, which is now used nationally and internationally to help preserve uh, organs as well as expand the ability to transplant organs. And then in the 1980s and 1990s, there were a lot of clinical trials that were done that really laid the groundwork for FDA approval for what is now considered the backbone of modern immunosuppressive therapy. And a lot of that work was also done at our institution. So, you know, we've seen this disconnect between all this work done in improving one-year outcomes that hasn't translated into long-term outcomes. So that leads to the question, why do kidney transplants fail? So this was a study that was done looking at a large number of kidney transplant patients over a span of 30 years and looking at causes of graft failure. And so they identified cause of graft failure for each, for each case. And what they found was that the major cause of graft failure was antibody-mediated rejection. So, and this was accounting for about 50% of graft failures. And they also looked at this longitudinally over time. And they see that early on, a lot of the findings that they would see for pathology would be nonspecific changes or infection or acute rejection. But really, what started to emerge at year one and beyond was antibody-mediated rejection being the primary finding on pathology. And as a result of this, this led to the finding that the major cause of late graft failure was due to antibody-mediated rejection. So how does antibody-mediated rejection lead to graft failure? <clears throat> so people have done studies looking at clinically at patients as well as there have been observational studies done in a non-human primate model to really characterize the process. And they've identified four stages involved with antibody-mediated rejection. First up, there's development of donor-specific antibody, or DSA. 
Following that, we see development of inflammation within the graft. And so we look for a few mediators of inflammation, inflammatory proteins like C4D, evidence of inflammation in the graft like glomerulitis and capillaritis. The next stage, we start to see actual changes to the kidney tissue itself. And one of the major pathology findings that we find is transplant glomerulopathy. And then later on, we start to see clinical dysfunction, where we find changes in proteinuria and increasing creatinine in these patients. What's happening, getting down to the molecular and cellular level, the main target of the immune system uh, in the allograft is the endothelium. And so donor-specific antibodies are generated. They bind to epitopes that are on the endothelial cell surface. So you can see that green DSA antibody binding there. And the stem of the antibody has complement binding regions. And those complement binding regions initiate the complement cascade. And we start to see activation and breakdown of complement products. One of those products is C4D. And that ends up binding and labeling the surface of the endothelial cells. As a result of antibody binding, complement activation, the endothelial cells become injured and activated. They start to release chemokines. They put adhesion molecules up on their surface. And all of these things acting together promote leukocyte infiltration and inflammation into the allograft. Clinically, what do we see? Well, a biopsy is necessary to make the diagnosis. And we look for all of these exact same things that we have observed being part of the pathogenesis. So we look for inflammatory proteins, such as C4D. And so the, the panel showing the green staining is showing areas of endothelium where the surface is coated with this complement protein C4D. We look for evidence of acute inflammation. And so the black circle is showing you a capillary. The thing we don't see in this capillary is a lumen, and it's because it's stuffed full of inflammatory cells. So this is evidence of capillaritis. The red circle is showing you a glomerular capillary loop. And again, we do not see a lumen. It's stuffed full of inflammatory cells. So we see evidence of glomerulitis. If these things are progressive and chronic, they can lead to actual alterations in the kidney tissue itself. And one of the major findings that we'll find is transplant glomerulopathy. And so in the enlarged inset there, what I'm showing you are some glomerular capillary loops, and the blue arrows are pointing out areas of those capillary loops that have thickened. And so that glomerulus is no longer functioning well because that filtration membrane has become thickened and it no longer functions and filters like it should. So I'm sure that that patient has proteinuria. Eventually, that glomerulus will stop working. The eventually, the nephron will drop out. You'll get reduced functioning renal mass. Uh, and then you'll get changes in GFR of your patient. So to summarize this section, chronic rejection in the form of antibody-mediated rejection is the major cause of graft failure. And this involves acute injury, inflammation, and then progression to chronic injury, transplant glomerulopathy. So I'd like to move on and discuss our current understanding of the mechanisms and therapeutics to prevent graft failure. And specifically, I'd like to talk about some of the research that we're doing here. So in addressing some of the challenges that we've already talked about, some of the challenges we're encountering, we know that supply does not equal demand. We know that graft half-life also is not ideal. And we know that graft failure has significant health impact for our patients. So how can we address this? Well, we can come up with two options. Option one, we can try to increase the availability of donor kidneys. Option two, we can try to maintain the long-term function of patients who have an existing kidney transplant. So our research program focuses on finding ways to prevent graft failure with the ultimate goal of getting to one kidney for life. So to better understand that and how to address this problem, we certainly need to understand antibody-mediated rejection well since this is a major cause of late graft failure. To make that diagnosis, there are three elements to the diagnosis. First up, we need pathology. So we need evidence of chronic tissue injury. And in most cases, that's finding evidence of transplant glomerulopathy. Secondly, we need inflammation. So we need evidence that antibody has interacted with the vascular endothelium. And ways that we do this, we look for evidence of C4D. We look for evidence of microvascular inflammation. And then third, we look for pathogenic antibodies. So we're looking for donor-specific antibodies, or DSA. However, would it surprise you that in a lot of clinical cases, not everything works out like that, and that a lot of patients don't read the textbook? So oftentimes, we'll find biopsies that are C4D negative. 
So C4D happens to have low sensitivity. And depending on the study that you're looking at and how they describe their patient cohort, these numbers range widely. So they can range anywhere from 0 to 70% of biopsies that are positive for C4D. Another problem with C4D is that this staining is transient and fleeting. And so studies have been done where patients have been biopsied over a period of time, and we can see differences over a span of a few days or a few weeks where we have positive staining, negative staining, positive staining. So this happens with such regularity and such frequency that one of the international consensus guidelines now recognizes C4D negative antibody-mediated rejection as a separate entity. So we wanted to look at this in terms of our patient population and ask the question, well, how well do these things perform in the patients that we're looking at? And how do they function as a diagnostic and as a prognostic marker? So we had looked at a cohort of patients who have transplant glomerulopathy. And what we found in our cohort was similar to published data, where about half of these patients were C4D negative. We then divided this group with transplant glomerulopathy up into patients uh, who were positive and negative for C4D. And we looked at allograft survival. So on the graph, y-axis is allograft survival. And we're interested to see maybe this helps to predict outcomes and identifies those patients at risk for graft loss. But we found that C4D staining did not correlate with outcomes. What about DSA? So we found that DSA uh, was negative in about 30% of this patient population. And similar to C4D, we did not find correlations with outcomes. So this has led to us researching other markers for graft failure in this patient population. We realize and acknowledge that C4D has some limitations. In our study, we found that C4D and DSA did not correlate well with outcomes, leading to this question, is there a better marker for allograft injury? In some prior work that I had done, I had looked in native kidney disease and found that complement activation and deposition within the glomerulus was really important in terms of uh, exacerbating native kidney disease, which led to the question, well, what could this be doing in the transplant setting? So we looked at the complement protein C3 in patients with transplant glomerulopathy. So we had looked at over 100 patients who were diagnosed on biopsy with transplant glomerulopathy between the years of 2011 to 2014, divided them up into two groups, those that were C3 positive and those that were C3 negative. And with a median follow-up time of about three years, we see very different uh, results in terms of graft survival. So those patients who were C3 negative, 55% of those patients reached graft failure. Patients who were C3 positive, 78% of those patients reached graft failure. And then I'm just showing the, the Kaplan-Meier in terms of overall differences. We found significant differences in terms of graft survival with these patients. Stratifying this a little bit different way, we were interested in looking at, well, does the amount of C3 uh, impact graft survival? And we found that it did. So looking at C3 deposition for those patients who were negative, so had a score of zero, score of one um, corresponding to kind of low level staining, score of two moderate staining, and score of three high level of staining, we see a stepwise increase in terms of graft loss for these patients. So putting that together in terms of what could this possibly mean. So this is just a, a little summary of, of the complement system, that we have three main uh, branches that come into the complement system. And with antibody-mediated rejection, this is usually activated through the classical pathway because it's driven by antibodies. So interpreting this data, one possibility is that we are operating through the classical pathway as we would expect with antibody-mediated rejection. The problem being that one of the products that we look at, the C4D, is, is not the best marker for some of the patient populations we're looking at. So potentially, a different marker like C3 is a better biomarker to look at. The other option is that we're operating through a different pathway. I do not think we're operating through the pathway, the lectin pathway, because that's usually initiated by pathogens. But the other possibility to consider is that this could be through the alternative pathway. And I think that's an area that warrants further investigation into. Um, because at this point, um, it hasn't been fully appreciated to what extent this could be involved with antibody-mediated rejection. So moving away from some of the complement side of rejection into the side of antibodies, we know that donor-specific antibodies are important, and donor-specific antibodies fall into this group of antibodies that we would label as alloantibodies. 
But we know there's a significant number of patients who wind up being donor-specific antibody negative. However, we do a biopsy on these patients, and it looks exactly like they have inflammation and antibody-mediated rejection. So what is going on with those patients? Is it possible that they have antibodies that we're just not detecting? If so, what could those antibodies represent? Is it possible that those could represent autoantibodies? And so studies have been done investigating this, and one thing that people have found is that a lot of times antibodies are directed against certain markers, certain um, uh, epitopes that are expressed on endothelial cells, since we know endothelial cells are a big target in antibody-mediated rejection. And one such thing is, that has been described is antibodies directed at the angiotensin receptor on endothelial cells. And people have identified cases of antibody-mediated rejection due to antibodies directed at angiotensin receptor. And it does seem to have an impact in terms of outcomes. So in the middle graph, it's looking at graph survival. And you can see that those patients who were positive for these angiotensin receptor antibodies had worse graph survival. So knowing that led to kind of an innovative treatment for this particular case where people had thought, well, if these are antibodies directed at this angiotensin receptor, why don't we target our therapy in that way? So they applied therapy by using an angiotensin receptor blocker, Losartan, and then they also did plasmapheresis, removal of antibody. And they found when they did that, that was associated with graft survival compared to those patients who received no treatment. So better understanding the immunologic mechanisms at play can really help to lead you in the direction of directed therapeutics. So summary for this section, uh, a lot of recent research has changed, to, changed into thinking in terms of the pathway from rejection to graft failure. And it certainly highlights the need for better biomarkers. And this might be biomarkers where we're better able to profile activation through the complement system and which pathways are being activated. Part of that might be by identifying the proteins that are involved. Other groups have looked at transcriptomics and being able to identify um, production of different complement regulatory proteins that are in the graft. So um, there are a lot of different ways that we can profile for complement activation. Also, people are trying to better profile the antibodies that may be involved. A lot of times our approach is to look at donor-specific antibodies, but in those cases where patients have evidence of pathology that supports antibody-mediated rejection but are antibody negative, a lot of people are now advocating to do a workup to really evaluate for non-donor-specific antibodies. And this has evolved our thinking over time. So we used to focus much more on acute rejection, and now a lot of the thinking is that there's probably some indolent subclinical rejection that is occurring, and this ongoing inflammation is um, progressing to graft failure. And this may be due to previously unrecognized inflammatory pathways, pathways that involved non-donor-specific antibody, pathways involving complement activation that we weren't able to um, accurately diagnose or appreciate, as well as endothelial cell injury. So moving away from some of the pathophysiology into therapeutics, uh, there have been a lot of studies done in this area to identify, are there any potential therapeutics that we could use? And there was a meta-analysis done. This is looking at the effect of plasmapheresis on antibody-mediated rejection. And a few points to notice here. One is that overall sample size is small. So a lot of these samples range from 10 to 50 patients. And when they combined all the data, what they found was using plasmapheresis, so removal of antibody, was favored to have benefit. However, this crossed one, so we found that it was not significant. And this has led to an FDA workshop that was done evaluating data on treatments like plasmapheresis as well as other immunotherapeutics. And at the conclusion of that workshop, what they came up with is that the, the data was not there to be able to recommend any particular treatment for antibody-mediated rejection. So at this point, we have no FDA approvements, approved treatments for treatment of antibody-mediated rejection. And one of the main takeaways from this workshop was that this still represents an important and unmet medical need. So looking at our patients, um, we were interested in how do our patients do with various treatments. So we identified patients who had biopsy-proven chronic antibody-mediated rejection and found that those patients progressed to graft failure in a median time of 1.9 years. And they had high rates of graft failure, so 76% of patients. And then stratifying these patients by treatment, what we found, those patients who were untreated had a pretty rapid course to graft failure. 
patients who had received treatment, which involves steroids, IVIG, rituximab, had better graft survival. And overall, in risk assessment, risk assessment, we found that treatment was associated with reduced risk of graft failure. So we're able to look at this a little bit more mechanistically in the lab. And one way we're able to do this is to utilize an animal model. And there are a few nice things here where we can manipulate this model in terms of being able to adjust how well matched donor and recipient are or how mismatched donor and recipient are as well as we're able to do things like manipulate the immune systems of the animal model. And we can knock out different parts of the immune system. So what I'm showing you here, uh, one is a photo that's an intra-op photo of a rat undergoing a kidney transplant. And the other photo is one of the genetic strains that we're currently investigating. So using CRISPR technology, we're able to develop a B cell deficient strain. So that's sort of analogous to patients who have gotten rituximab. And what I'm showing you on the top panel is a picture actually of spleen, not kidney. And the black arrows are showing the regions of B cells in the spleen. And then for comparison, the B cell deficient group, there are no black arrows because there are no B cells that are there. We also looked at this to quantify numbers of B cells um, by flow cytometry. And so in the lower panels, that's what's being shown. 40% of the cells in the spleen in the wild type were identified as B cells compared to B cell deficient group, which lacked B cells. So we were able to set up a few different treatment groups where we can do a matched transplant, a mismatched transplant, a sensitized mismatched transplant. So this is something that's rather similar to what we see in our patient population. So patients who have had a prior transplant are sensitized. Patients who have had blood transfusions or pregnancy will oftentimes become sensitized. And then the fourth group was using this B cell deficient group and we looked at time points of three months and six months. And so we're interested to see what do these uh, animals do in terms of developing transplant glomerulopathy. So in the photos, the first photo is just showing you a, a, cap, a glomerular capillary loop. The red line shows you the length of glomerular basement membrane. The yellow line is showing you the area of pathology where that glomerular basement membrane has thickened and is no longer filtering. And so we did this measurement across all of our different cohorts and what we found was that in the well-matched group, we have low levels of pathology. In the mismatched group, this increased over time. In the sensitized group, the green group, this increased even more over time. And with the B-cell deficient group, we saw that we were able to prevent this pathology from forming. So what we're seeing in the animal model mirrors what we've seen in our patient population. And moving forward, there may be even better therapeutics to consider. So one such thing that's in kind of an emerging field is looking at B cell activating factor, also called BAF, as a potential therapeutic target. And there are a few reasons to consider this as a target. Um, one thing being that rodent models that are deficient in BAF, we know they have reduced numbers of B cells and reduced antibody production. And so in the lower panels, I'm showing you some graphs of a B cell deficient rat strain that we have that we can show that they have reduced numbers of B cells and reduced production of IgG antibody. Other groups have found that levels of BAF correlate well with disease activity in a variety of autoimmune diseases that are B cell mediated. And those observations have led to development of anti-BAF therapy. So there are therapeutics available, belimumab is one, and it's actually become FDA approved for treatment of lupus. So leading to something that's a potentially viable clinical option. So, you know, research into the area of therapeutics is evolving, and a lot of ongoing research is looking at things like use of rituximab targeted at B cells, use of B cell survival factors targeted at BAF, and then some people are also looking at targeting B cells further down their pathway that are more mature and antibody producing, such as plasma cells, and so looking at proteasome inhibitors such as bortezomib. So getting to chronic rejection, is there hope? Uh, I think so, and I think what we're seeing is that this field is really evolving and moving forward and moving towards this direction of being a more precision medicine-based field where we can offer better therapeutics and better immunologic profiling, and we're able to better characterize the amount of immune activity in these patients, and we can do that at time of transplant, at time of biopsy diagnosis, and then throughout their treatment course. And Understanding these mechanisms that are in play will lead to better clinical trials of targeted immunotherapy, ultimately moving us closer to this goal of getting to one kidney for life.
So, so certainly I need to say a big thank you to everybody involved. Doing work like this takes a real team, and so there's certainly a, a big team involved behind all of this work. So a big thank you to everybody who's helped and supported me through the Department of Medicine, all of those members in the lab who have put in countless hours towards this work, our collaborators in the Department of Surgery and Pathology, as well as at other institutions in Colorado, and all of the research cores and support and funding. And with that, I will close, and I will open things up to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Pant. Excellent. Open up to questions. She will call on anyone. Yes. <laughs> so the question was, how, using this animal model and some of the data that we've looked at, targeting the complement system using a therapeutic like echolizumab, has that been looked at? So the answer is yes, that is certainly an area of interest. And so both in the animal model, people have looked at targeting complement. Um, people have done knockout studies where they've knocked out C3. And it hasn't been looked at in a kidney transplant model, but it's looked at skin transplant model. Um, and they did find that they were able to delay uh, rejection of that transplant by knocking out C3. And then at the clinical level, people have tried using echolizumab in rejection. Um, the, the results have, have not been overwhelming, but of course all of the sample sizes are small. They're mostly case-based series. So the jury is still out on, on use of echolizumab overall. It hasn't been totally favorable, but there are other complement inhibitors that are coming through the pipeline, targeting at different levels of the complement system. So we may see differences if we target more proximately versus more terminally in the complement cascade. So more to come. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so that's, so the, the question is about using some sort of therapy targeted as an anti, directed against the antibody sort of therapeutic. Um, and, and yes, that is something that is an area of study. So that's part of the rationale behind uh, IVIG, as well as there are other studies that are being done looking at therapeutics that may actually be able to degrade antibodies. And so people are certainly looking at antibodies as being the pathologic entity in this disease, and either can we reduce those numbers either by something like plasmapheresis, can we degrade that antibody by using some agent directed at that antibody, or could we bind up that antibody so that it doesn't get to its antigen target? So the, the question was asking about risk of infection in patients who are given IVIG, steroids, and rituximab. Um, so in that study, we didn't have a significant increase in infections, but certainly it is something of concern um, because for these patients, they're being given baseline immunosuppression, and then if they have an episode of rejection, we give them even more intense immunosuppression. Um, so certainly it is a complication that we do run into. Um, and it's an area of concern. But in that study, we didn't see a significant increase in infection. Hey, Doc. Uh, I have a question about uh, how uh, the induction therapy uh, influences the incidence of PMR. So the, the question is about um, induction regimen and how that impacts antibody mediated rejection. Um, so in terms of induction regimens, um, you know, a lot of times we'll gear our induction regimen based on patient characteristics. So certain groups of patients we know are more likely to develop antibody mediated rejection, in particular sensitized patients. So part of it is identifying your screening patient and those patients who are sensitized who have a lot of preformed antibodies. 
we're get, we are going to target our induction and regimen slightly different for those patients. Or um, not just choosing the induction agent, being able to do desensitization prior to transplant. So even pre-transplant, giving them something like rituximab or phoresis or something to try to remove the antibodies that are present at time of transplant. Thank you. Excellent.